Next week, Sunday, is the 1st of August, and uh, the months are just flying by. Um, the president is having a family meeting with us this evening, and I know we've said that for the month of July, there will be no in-house meetings. And so we are basically waiting on him to speak this evening so that we know what the next step is for us as a church, if we are allowed to meet and gather together. Um, so once we have heard from him this evening, we will inform you as a church what our next step will be for next week and for the month of August, and we will make contact with you and make sure that you are all aware of where we are at. Um, so for now, um, uh, we'll have to just keep you posted, so hold on for that announcement, and that will come possibly this evening, um, otherwise by tomorrow morning. I'd like to encourage you to continue praying for uh, our needs within our bulletin. Those of you who received it on the WhatsApp group, please pray for those uh, personal needs. Also pray for our church planters in the Western province um, and also for all of those uh, our other partners that we've been praying for. Um, I'd appreciate that if you would spend some time praying for those items specifically. And then also... Um, we are all aware of the unrest that's taking place um, within our country uh, and all the looting and the taxi and bus violence. Let's also spend time united as a church praying against those things that are bringing havoc to our country. We want to have peace. We want to live in peace. We want um, to experience God's protection over our family, over our friends and our colleagues. So we need to unite in prayer as we ask God to do that. There are a few birthdays this week. I want to pray a special blessing on Ivan Smith and Alfredo Lobodas Neves as they celebrate their birthdays on the 27th of July. That's on Tuesday. And then also on the 31st of July on Saturday, we have Christo Cruiser and Nicoline Fuentos, the twins. May God bless you on your birthday as well. And may he truly pour his favor over your lives as you celeb celebrate this week. Alison, am I right? Is it a big birthday for Alfredo? Yes, he's 60th this week. Um, uh, Alfredo, may God bless you on your 60th as you celebrate with your family. I'm sure Alison is going to bake something nicely for you um, and, and uh, treat you this week. For those celebrating their birthdays and for us as a church, let me share uh, the devotion that Bernie shared on our uh, WhatsApp group this morning. I found it so appropriate for us during this time um, of being separated from each other physically. Um, Proverbs 18 verse 24 says, There are no friends who destroy each other, but a real friend sticks closer than a brother. Loneliness is everywhere. I'm sure there are so many of you that have experienced loneliness during this time of, of being locked down and locked in in your homes. Many people feel cut off and alienated from others. Being in a crowd just makes people more aware of their isolation. We all need friends who will stick close, listen, care, and offer help when it is needed. In good times and bad, it is better to have one such friend than dozen of superficial acquaintances. Instead of wishing you could find a true friend, seek to become one. There are people who need your friendship. 
Ask God to reveal them to you and then take on the challenge of being a true friend. My encouragement to all of us this morning is to become that true friend to others. I know we are limited. We can't go and physically spend time with people um, and go into their homes. But we all have phones. We all can send WhatsApp and make phone calls just to be there to encourage and bless each other. My encouragement to each one of us that we would take an opportunity in this week to make one new friend and truly be a genuine, godly, encouraging friend to them. May God bless them through you and may we be a blessing to each other. Let's bow our heads as we open our service in prayer and as we, sp as we pray a special blessing on those celebrating a birthday this week. Father God, we are so grateful that we can come together this morning gathered in unity, Father God, online and, and just the few of us in-house, Lord, just to worship you. We're going to spend a few moments in worship this morning, singing songs of, of praise and glory and honor unto your holy name, declaring that you truly are a good, good Father. Uh, Father God, you have been so faithful to us, and we want to praise you and worship you this morning. But also in our time of worship, we ask, Father God, that you would prepare the soil of our hearts, that as we receive from your word this morning from the book of Joshua, um, Lord, that we would truly be encouraged, that we would be reminded that you are the God who makes and keeps promises. And so we pray your special blessing on us this morning. We pray, Lord, that you would truly fall afresh on us this morning, and that we would experience the power of your Spirit at work within our hearts and lives. Father God, for those who are struggling, for those who are facing various uh, walls uh, or, or difficulties or challenges, Lord, I pray that you would help them to become victorious. Lord, that we would not lose hope, but we would become overcomers because of what you have done and what you continue to do in our lives and through our lives. Lord, I pray a special blessing on Ivan's life and Alfredo's life as they celebrate a birthday on Tuesday. Also on Christu and Nicoline, Father God, as they celebrate on Saturday. May they truly experience your goodness, your mercy and your grace in their lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name with much thanksgiving. Won't you go ahead of us now? Prepare our hearts. In Jesus' name we ask this. Amen.
change to Jesus. 
Jesus, you're still enough. Keep me within your love. My heart will sing your praise again. Your promise still stands. Great is your faith. This morning, Lord God, your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness towards us this morning, Lord Jesus. We are reminded this morning again that you are still in control. And yes, we might be facing many challenges. And by now, Lord God, we would have thought that we would have overcome. But we will still hold on because we serve a good God. We serve a good Father. We serve a God who has been good to us and who will continue to be good to us. I pray, Lord God, that we'll hold on 
to the peace that comes from knowing that our anxious hearts can rest in our God this morning. And that a peace that surpasses all understanding can come, can come over each and every one of us. We think of those of God this morning who will need a touch from you. It may be a physical thing, an emotional, spiritual, that you would meet them right where they are in the name of Jesus. That you would meet them right where they are. I pray, Lord God, that as your church together we will sing that our God is good and that we will, will believe and trust. Even if it doesn't look good right now, we know that sorrow is but for the night. But joy, joy comes.
know my life you have been so so good with every breath that I have made and I will sing of the goodness of God and I will sing of the goodness of God and I will sing of the goodness says that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are God. And I pray we, your children, now want to come and say that you are good. You are good, Father. You've been good to us. Oh, Jesus, if we think of where you've brought us from and how far you've carried us, I pray, Lord God, that often our present afflictions blur the goodness of God. But I pray, Lord God, that we will not allow our circumstance, our situation, to impact us this morning but we'll grab hold of the truth of God this morning yes there's the reality of the situation but there's the truth of our God in the situation that you never leave us nor do you forsake us that you are with us through it all you are Emmanuel this morning a God who is with us we think of the rich young ruler that ran up to Jesus and we said good teacher Jesus responded by saying only God is good and that is the God we serve this morning the God who has compassion on us, and the God who wants to meet us right where we are. In Jesus' name I pray. Oh, that we would believe this morning that you are good. And I've seen. And I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you
so undeniable I can hardly speak peace so morning, Lord God, you are good and that is who you are. Remind us once again that we are loved, but that you call us to a deeper love with you, a deeper relationship with you. I pray that as your people, no longer will we seek a surface level relationship with you, but a deep one, an intimate one, that right now where we are, from the place that we are, you can meet us and we can journey with you out of the pit, out of the place that feels like it's never going to end. We believe this morning that we will see the walls come down in the lives of those who are afflicted this morning, maybe physically, emotionally, spiritually. We believe this morning, Lord Jesus, that you are more than able to do exceedingly abundantly above everything that we can think or conceive or believe. We believe this morning that, Jesus, you are still the answer. You are still the answer to the world's questions. You are still the answer to our problems. You are still the one that will carry us through. I pray that we will hold on to who you are. I pray this morning that as you call us deeper, that we would begin to pray without ceasing, that we would pray diligently without giving up, without quitting, without throwing in the towel, that we would continue to seek you in your scripture, continue to seek you in your word, that your word and your statutes are heritage forever. We pray this morning that your word truly is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And as Jesus teaches, that when we live according to your scriptures and we do that which you have taught us to do, that our foundation is sure, that regardless of the circumstance outside, we, Lord God, will hold strong because you are our anchor this morning. I pray that as our pastor speaks, as he ministers your word, as he speaks about the wall that will come down, that would, you would use him as your mouthpiece. Pray, Lord God, that you give him an excitement, a joy, Lord God, an overwhelming sense of your presence, that as he speaks the word, that he would do so, not holding back anything, but being used by you, God. As we 
have communion this morning, that we would be reminded of the cross and that the cross still washes us white as snow. And the cross is the reason we can have a relationship with you this morning. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen and Amen. amen. God who makes and keeps promises. Have you taken a moment during this series to reflect on God's promises? Have you taken a moment during this series to reflect on how God has kept His promises to you? I want to encourage you to do so, seeing that that is the whole theme of this series. The God who makes and keeps promises. Now I have been making an extra effort to take time to ponder on God's goodness more often since the beginning of the series. It has encouraged me to take time to sit every day and ponder on the goodness of God. Ponder on God's faithfulness. To think about God's promises in my life that He has kept. Now, I must be honest, as I have done this day in and day out, I have found it to be a great source of fuel, a great source of encouragement when I have faced personal challenges every day just looking and thinking about God's goodness to me personally, to, me, uh, to us as a church, to, to us as a, a family. You know, that has fueled me and encouraged me to keep on going. So I want to encourage you to take those moments every day and think about the goodness, think about the promises, think about the faithfulness of God, the God who makes and keeps promises. We sang a song earlier this morning that said, I see you move, you move the mountain, and I believe. I'll see you do it again. You made a way where there was no way. And I believe I'll see you do it again. You see, as we have seen God come through for us, so we will be reminded that God will continue to be faithful in all He says and does. Now, as I said right in the beginning of the series, if we don't believe in the promise maker, then we cannot expect to experience the promise. Let me repeat that. If we don't believe in the promise maker, we cannot expect to experience the promise. We need to believe that God is who His Word says He is, and that He will do what His Word says He can and will do. You see, we need to believe in God's Word. We need to believe in His abilities. We need to believe in His strength. We need to believe that He is the God who will fulfill the promises that He has made to us. You see, it is pointless if we pray to God, but we don't believe with all our heart that He can and will do what He says or what we ask of Him. It's pointless to believe or to pray to a God when we don't believe that He can actually fulfill those promises. You see, we need to believe that He is the mountain mover. We need to believe that He can calm the storm. We need to believe that He can make a way where there seems to be no way. We need to believe that He goes with us and is with us when we are facing the wall. 
And that is the title of this morning's message, Facing the Wall. And now we look at Joshua and the Israelites as we're facing the walls of Jericho. And I want to personalize that this morning, saying, Facing our wall, facing my wall. We all are facing challenges of one sort or another. We are facing either illness or, or difficulty, financial struggle, mental difficulties, emotional struggles, struggles within the home, struggles at work. The, the list is unending. We are all facing a war of some sort. And I want us to, to truly listen to this morning's message because there is only one way to overcome this war. There is only one way for this wall to come crashing down and for us to be victorious. Now, I'm not going to read the entire account of Joshua chapter 6. We know this story very well. As I said last week, it is one of my favorite passages. As a kid, I can remember walking around the walls of Jericho in one of our Sunday school plays. And we sang this, around the walls of Jericho, the army marched. Seven times without a doubt, the army marched. When the people gave a shout, when the people gave a shout, when the people gave a shout, the walls fell down. My wife is laughing at me. But that is what we sang. I remember it as it was yesterday. We were in the old uh, Sunday, the old church still at that time. And I remember marching around this cardboard wall and how the walls came crashing down. You see, one thing that immediately stands out for me in this passage. Apart from the very last moment of this falling of the walls. This war seems very mundane in its repetitiveness. I mean, walking around the walls of Jericho for six days before anything even happens. Now, I don't think you expected me to say that after just singing that song. But I'm sure we can all think of some movies or some series where um, war is depicted, or even the harshness of war is depicted. The TV series Band of Brothers, for those of you who've watched that, was a milestone in special effects. And it wasn't glamorizing so much, but showing the horror of war. When you are at war, you can see that it is a, a horrendous thing. People's lives are being lost. It is violent. And here, in Joshua chapter 6, we see God's people trekking around a wall for six days in utter silence. Now, there must have been a reason for that. I must... I'm trying to picture the, the Jerichans or the Jerichoans or whatever you would call the people of Jericho. I can picture them standing on top of this wall, looking down at this people, firstly afraid because God's army is coming. And then maybe day two and day three, what are they up to? They aren't doing anything. What kind of a war is this? They're just walking around the wall. What is really happening? Now, as I said, there must have been a reason for this. And I believe I found the answer. But let's read Joshua chapter 6, verse 1 to 5. And then we'll read verse 12 to 14. And I see, we will find, I believe we'll find the answer in those couple of verses. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with a priest blowing the trumpets. 
when you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the, oh, the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up. Everyone straight in. Verse 12, Joshua got up early the next morning and the priest took up the ark of the Lord. The seven priests carrying the seven trumpets went forward, marching before the ark of the Lord and blowing the trumpets. The armed men went ahead of them and the rear guard followed the ark of the Lord while the trumpets kept sounding. So on the second day they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. They did this for six days. May God bless the reading of his word to us this morning. There was silence for those six days while walking around the walls because the presence of God was being highlighted. I said there must have been a reason why God wanted his people to walk around those walls for six days. Now we already know that the people of Jericho were afraid. The king was afraid. Everybody was trembling. The doors, the gates were shut. No one went in. No one went out. But I believe as they marched around those walls, the silence of the people are highlighted for themselves and for the people in the walls, the presence of God. Now three things about the presence of God stand out in this passage. And the first thing that gives the indication that the presence of God is so important was that the ark of the covenant dominates these early verses. We find, I think it is twice or three times, where the ark is mentioned as the people walk, as the people go, the ark of the covenant goes with them. And we know from a few messages past that the ark represents the presence of God. You see, what seemed to be mundane and repetitive was actually quite the opposite. We see once again how important it is to focus on the presence of God. What was the first thing that God said to Joshua and Joshua in those verses between verse 5 and 12? That's where he says that to the, the, the army, what they are about to do in verse 12 onwards. We see the important thing is that the ark had to go with. Now, I can't imagine the ark was very light. I can't imagine that it was easy going to carry the ark around the walls of Jericho. And I'm thinking in my planning, knowing that on the seventh day the walls are going to go down, why not let the priests and the ark rest for the first six days? Why not leave it behind and just get the people to walk around the walls? And on the seventh day it makes more sense then to carry the ark of the Lord. But God says to them, on day one, pick up the ark and walk with the ark around the walls. You see, it was important that they focused on the presence of God as they go. It's important for us to focus on the presence of the Lord, not to run ahead not to lag behind, but to remain close to the presence of the Lord. As the journey continued round and round and round the walls of Jericho, one thing was evident at all times. The presence of God went with his people. It wasn't about the people. It wasn't even about the journey around the walls. It was all about recognizing the presence of God. The second thing of the presence of the Lord is that it is the Lord who will defeat Jericho. And I think, I believe the people had come to understand that by now, that without the presence of God, they will not be victorious. I mean, they had just crossed the Jordan and they saw with their own eyes as the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant, as their feet touched the water, so the water parted. 
as they rested in the middle of the Jordan, so everybody was able to cross. As they moved onto the other side and they left the water area, the water closed back again. You see, they had come to recognize that where the presence of the Lord is, there is victory. Where the presence of the Lord is, there is power. Now, if we are honest with ourselves, we'd quickly realize that it was God who defeated Jericho. It wasn't the army who defeated Jericho. It wasn't that they were powerful. It wasn't that Joshua was a good leader and a good warrior. It was the presence. It was the power. It was God himself who defeated Jericho. Now, how often do we try and fight our own battle in our own strength? How often do we exhaust ourselves trying to overcome the obstacles in our lives? How often do we run ahead instead of allowing the presence of God to go before us and with us to bring those walls down? How often aren't we guilty of doing that? The third thing of the presence of the Lord that we see is of vital importance here is that Israel had to play their part, but under God's command. Israel had to play their part, but under God's command. You see, the presence of God was there. They also understood that it was God who would make them victorious. It was God who would fight the battle. It was God who would defeat uh, Jericho, but they also had to play their part under God's command. Now it is important for us to understand the power and the presence of God and how vital it is, or rather how vital He is in our lives. We need to depend on the presence of God. We need to depend on the guidance of God. We need to depend on the Word of God. We, we also need to realize that it is God who is fighting our battles, and He is the one, and only He, is the one who will make us victorious. But there's also a third element at work here. Israel had a part to play. Israel had to follow in obedience. Even though this instruction sounded and looked ridiculous, walking around a wall for six days, I mean, surely there's something better we can do. Why not just make us victorious on day one? Why, God, you're all powerful. Why can't you just cause this wall to collapse on day one? I mean, why must we put so much mileage on our sandals? Here's the thing. They obeyed. They recognized the presence of God. They recognized the power of God. But they also recognized that they had to obey. They had to play their part in this journey. Here's the thing. We need to come under God's leadership. We need to come, we need to come under God's authority. We need to be willing to follow God. God's command in obedience. Joshua 6 verse 15 to 17, as we look at our second point, reads as follows. On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall be spared, because she hid the spies we sent. Now secondly, I want to look at the rescue of Rahab. Here we see how um, the Israelites were victorious. Or, or not quite yet. We haven't seen the story fulfilled, being fulfilled yet. But we see it being initial, init, initialized. <laughs> that sounds wrong. But we see it coming to a head. 
Now, one thing that intrigued me quite a bit, and this led me to believe once again, to see God's hand at work in victory. Just to see how Rahab was spared. You, you can only see God's hand at work here. Remember a few weeks ago, when we spoke about the account of the spies, we were given the details of Rahab's house. Now we know that Rahab's house was built in the wall of the city. We know that, and it gives us account that you could see the window from outside. Remember, that's where the scarlet cord, cord was hung and clearly visible. Rahab's house was built in the city walls. We just read now that the walls came crumbling down. Now, I don't care how clever or strategic Joshua was, but there is no way that he could plan that one section of the wall would not collapse. There is no way that he could have planned that only one house that is part of the wall would be spared as they marched around the walls. Remember, he was told that they must walk around the walls and the walls will come crumbling down and you will be victorious. Yet it is clear that God spared Rahab. It wasn't through, through man. It wasn't man's strength or man's power or man's ability. It was clear that God spared Rahab. It was clear that God spared Rahab and brought her into the fold because of her commitment and confession to him. Now, this just reminded me of the power of God at work. I mean, it is, firstly, it is a miracle to see the walls come crumbling down. Granted, but it is even, even a greater miracle for the walls to crumble down and only one section to remain intact. Rahab's house, where she and her family was kept safe. Now why is it that Rahab plays such a prominent role in this account? And I know I haven't read the entire passage this morning, but Rahab's, Rahab is mentioned a few times once again in this passage. Now, I believe she plays an important role, a vital role as a reminder to all of us that God can and will and has the power and ability to include anyone and everyone into his family when they commit to follow him. God is able to rescue the, the worst of sinners. He's able to cause everything around to crumble and be defeated and protect those who call on his name. We see this in verse 25, where Rahab and all who belonged to her were spared. And more importantly, the passage says that they were all brought into the family of God and they remain there as part of Israel to this day. You see, God is able to do the seemingly impossible. What we seem to think is impossible, God is able to do that. Now there's many that might think that how can a, a powerful, loving God love a sinner like me? How can a holy God love someone like me? And you could list on your hands, on your fingers, maybe you need some toes as well. All the things that you've done wrong, all the violent things that you've said or done or thought, deceitfulness, envy, all of those things. You can say all of those things this morning and say, how can I possibly deserve to be saved? But here's the thing. God loves us so much that he gave his one and only son to die on the cross for us. That whoever believes in him 
will have eternal life. You see, Rahab echoed those words. I know what your God has done. And I believe that your God is going to conquer this, uh, going to conquer Jericho. And I am going to, to stand with you, stand for you, assist you, guide you. And you see, because of that, because of her commitment to God, because of her commitment to God's people, she and all of her family were rescued. See, this morning I want to remind you to experience the power and the presence of God, we need to make that commitment. Like Rahab did, Rahab made that commitment and she and all of her family were spared because of that commitment. Verse 20 to 21 reads this, When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with a sword every living thing in it, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. Here we see the end of Jericho. Here we see the end of Jericho. And there's two things that stand out for me. Firstly, the miracle of the walls, how these walls came crashing down. And secondly, the judgment of defeat and curse. We firstly see that God is a miracle working God. You see, He and only He can make not just our walls fall, but to bring the entire situation to an end. You see, the walls of Jericho fell, but that was only the beginning of the end. That was the breakthrough that Israel needed. But we see that God carried His promise through to the very end. You see, the walls came crashing down, but that was not the end of the story. God saw the entire situation through to the very end. In the same way, we might see the breaking walls as breakthrough in our situation. Who of you have ever experienced a difficulty? And I've heard it being said so many times. Oh, I've seen a breakthrough in my situation. God is at work in my situation. But that does not mean the end of the story, does it? Sometimes that breakthrough has happened and that journey still continued for quite some time before you saw God making you victorious as that story, that journey came to an end. You see, as much as the breakthrough happens, we still need to see, we still need to face the trial to the very end. We need to go through it all to be victorious. You see, if the Israelites stopped with the walls crashing down, they would have not been victorious. They still had to go in and take the city. The promise that God makes is that He'll break down the walls and lead us to the very end in victory. You see, God will break down our walls of sin. God will break down the walls of our situations. God will break down the walls of our trials. But He also promises us that He will be with us. His presence will go with us. He will strengthen us and carry us and make us victorious at the very end of this trial. The very end of our situation. He will lead us to the very end into victory. The second thing is that there will be a judgment. You see, at the very end of this chapter, a judgment is pronounced that anyone who tries to rebuild this city will be cursed. In other words, anyone who builds against God, 
Anyone who tries to build their own kingdom will not enjoy the blessings that come with obedience to God's kingdom. Uh, if, if you look at those last few verses, if you read them at home, it was quite a harsh curse. Anyone who tries to rebuild Jericho, they will lose their first son. Anyone who tries to rebuild the gate will, re-lose, will, will lose their youngest son. It was quite a hectic curse. And here's the thing. When we try and build our own kingdom, like we've been guilty so many times, we say in our prayers, Lord, your will be done, but I'm doing my own thing. I'm doing things in my own strength. You see, I'm building my own kingdom on this earth instead of building God's kingdom or believing God's kingdom or obeying God's word. You see, we will enjoy the blessing that comes with obedience to God's kingdom. In fact, the very opposite will be their portion for those who do not. You see, they will not inherit eternal life, but eternal damnation. You see, when we are obedient to God's word and God's kingdom, when we call upon the name of the Lord, when we follow the presence of God, we are guaranteed as sons and daughters of the Most High God that we will receive eternal life. Now I want to end this message by summarizing it in three short words or phrases. And this was my initial three points. So you're getting six points this morning. The first thing that I want to say is, (laughs) I shared this with Bernie, but I won't say it this morning. I'll say it nicely. Be still. Be still. The Israelites needed to walk around those walls for six days in silence. Joshua warned them to be still, be quiet, don't say a word, don't shout. Psalm 46 verse 10 says this, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nation. I will be exalted in the earth. You see, sometimes we are making such a loud noise, moaning and groaning about our situation. Sometimes we are trying to do things in our own strength, making that noise that we don't even hear the voice of God. We don't even see the presence of God. In fact, we don't even experience the presence of God. Even though he is there with us, our noise, our cacophony of sound that is going on around us, our thoughts, our thinking, our doing, all of that drowns out the voice of God when we are walking around our situation. You see, there is only one thing that we should be saying and doing. We should be crying out to God and only Him. That's the only thing that we should be doing. We need to be quiet in the presence of God so that we can hear God speak, so that we can see God at work. So the first thing we need to do as we walk around a situation is be still and know that He is God. The second thing is that we need to obey. You see, there must be cooperation between God and man. When you are still, you hear from God. When you hear from God, you need to cooperate with God in obedience. Only God can remove the difficulties that stand in the way of an entirely consecrated and blessed life. But there are commands and duties which is unavoidable on us to fulfill. 
You see, there are things that we have to do. And sometimes we get this balance wrong. Sometimes we run ahead and do things in our own strength because we are not willing to be still to hear what we should be doing. Other times we say, his strength is perfect, with my strength is gone, I will just sit and wait and watch him carry on. That is also not good. You see, we need to be still so that we can hear from God, and then we need to follow in obedience. We have to cooperate with the word and the will of God. You see, the Israelites, even though at the beginning they might have thought, what is this all about? This doesn't make sense. Yet because they knew God, because they had heard from God, they obeyed this weird and strange command to walk around the wall for six times, six days. The third thing is this, we need to have faith. Be still, obey, and have faith. You see, we need to look away from all our preparations and even from our God-commanded acts to God Himself. Let me repeat that again. We need to look away from all our preparations, the things that we have to do, the things that we know God has called us to do. We must even look away from our God-commanded acts. We know God has told us to do that, but we need to keep our eyes on the God who has given us the instruction. We need to keep our eyes focused on the presence of God. We need to place our faith in Him. Otherwise, these acts, these preparations, these things that we are called to do will become tiresome. I can imagine there might have been some thinking around this journey how many more days, counting the steps, how long this thing is getting heavy to carry? Are you sure God said six days? Are you sure He said that some of us can go and others can stay behind? We can do a kind of rotation. Are you sure all of these things need to be done? You see, when we keep our eyes focused on what has to be done, when we keep our eyes focused on the things that we know God commanded us to do, and our eyes aren't on God himself, then these things become wearisome. These things become tiresome. We start losing our, our vigor. We start losing our, our commitment. We start losing our, our focus, our fuel, because we are so focused on the things that God commanded us to do that we have taken our eyes off the God who commanded us. To do these things. You see, we need to keep our eyes on God Himself. The other things are important, yes. The other things will also fall into place as we keep our eyes on Him. As we keep our eyes on God, our difficulties will melt away and we will see the walls fall down flat. You see, we will become victorious as we keep our eyes on Him. And so this is my encouragement to you this morning before we partake together of our communion. That we would experience the presence of God. That we would experience the power and ability of God, and that we would experience the victory through God. God is able to see us through. Remember, I've said this over and over again. This whole book of Joshua is about God, and it's important for us to get that. Because when God is the center of our focus, the center of our attention, so we are able to be conquerors in life. Now I'm not saying that our journey is all of a sudden going to be easy or smooth sailing. But when God is the center of our attention, He will carry us through. He will see us through. And we 
will be victorious. Why is that? Because the God who makes the promises keeps His promises. In the same way, if we take this story and put it into the New Testament context, if we take this story and put it into our personal context, we will see that the whole cross event is depicted in here as well. We see how if we put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ, we see the work that He completed on the cross was a work that was completed and taken to the very end so that we could be victorious. And so as we partake together this morning of the symbols, the bread that symbolizes His body that was broken for us, the juice that symbolizes His blood that was poured out for us, we remember something vitally important. That it is telling the same story. That as we focus on the presence of Jesus and what He has come to do for us, as we remember that He has made us victorious through His death and through His resurrection, we now live victorious lives because we are in Him. We have been healed. By His stripes we are healed. This morning as we partake together, let us remember the goodness of God. Let us remember the faithfulness of God. Let us remember how He loves us unconditionally. So much so that He sent His very own Son, His one and only Son, Jesus Christ, to walk this earth as a perfect example, to die on the cross to take upon himself the sins of the world, my sin, my shame, he took that upon himself. To do a complete work on the cross so that we could be victorious and gain access to the Father and eternal life. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he held up the bread and as he broke it, he said, this is my body broken for you. Take it and eat it in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. In the same way after supper, Jesus held up the cup, saying, this is my blood poured out for you. Take it and drink it in remembrance of me. For as much as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us partake together as we remember the sacrifice of our Savior and the victory that he brought us. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, this morning all we can say is thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for, for leaving and gifting us the Holy Spirit. Meaning that your presence is always with us. God in us. God with us. Thank you, Father God, for your power that is at work in us. The same power that broke down those walls that rescued Rahab after the commitment that she made. The same power that saw um, the Israelites 
victorious over Jericho. It's that same power that is at work within us. Thank you, Jesus. We also thank you, Father God, for making us victorious. And that you would be with us to the very end. Facing every battle, facing every challenge, facing every disappointment, every failure, to the very end. And helping us to be victorious over all these things. Carrying us all the way. Thank you, Jesus. This morning I pray, Father God, that you would bring us into alignment with your word. That we would be still to hear your voice. That we would be willing to obey what you say to us. And Lord, that we would have the faith to face this journey with you to the very end. May we not give up when the mountain terrain looks difficult. May we not give up when the valley seems to be unending. But may we have faith in the God who is able to do the seemingly impossible. The God who made the Israelites victorious. The God who made David victorious. The same God who will make us victorious. So we place our hope and our trust and our faith in you. And Father God, we, we commit this morning that we will obey your word. Guide us, Father God, through your spirit. Convict us, Father God, where we take a step off the path so that we can come into realignment with you once again and walk the journey of obedience, walk the journey of faith. And we can't do this in our own strength, so we do ask that you would go with us. And we echo the words of this closing song, In Christ alone I place my trust. And find my glory in the power of the cross. In every victory, let it be said of me, my source of strength, my source of hope is Christ alone. Amen. Amen. Let's stand to re together as we receive the benediction this morning. And then we are going to sing our closing song together. From Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20 and 21. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you.
praise the Lord. I place my trust and find my glory in the power of the cross. In Christ alone, I place my trust and find my glory. My source of hope is Christ alone. In Christ alone, I place my trust and find my glory in the power of the cross. In Christ alone. of strength, my source of hope is Christ alone. Amen. May Christ continue to be your source of strength this week.